Hello, everyone, and welcome to At Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Max Levchin, co-founder and CEO of Affirm. Max, great to see you. Great to be here. So why don't I start off by asking you about Affirm for those of us who don't know so much about it. It's now a, if I do say so myself, a nicely diminishing group of people. So we are available on Amazon and at Walmart and every little store you've ever heard of that calls Shopify their merchant platform home. We are visible at almost 65% of all e-commerce checkouts. So the number of people who actually have no idea what this thing is, is diminishing rapidly. But what it is, it's a payment product, a way to check out that you can think of as an alternative to credit card. If you are looking at a purchase that you'd rather pay for over time instead of a single payment right now, you can click on the Affirm logo and we will instantly give you a handful of choices. You can pay for it over a few weeks or a few months. It's always fixed term. So the real difference between us and credit cards is credit cards, the value proposition is just put it over here, pay for it as you see fit. And if you uh, don't pay too much attention, you'll probably pay a lot in fees and interest. The antidote that is a firm is actually will tell you exactly what the payment plan has to be. You will be done paying off the couch or the bicycle or whatever it is you just purchased in a very specific number of months. There are no late fees. There's no compounding. There's no revolving. You know exactly what we're going to pay. And that number is fixed. We've convinced tens of millions of people to give it a try. It's going pretty well. So it's buy now, pay later is kind of the business model, right? That, that's the moniker. That's the moniker. And so you've explained how it's different from a credit card. Are you paying interest in those payments? And what is your business model then? Sometimes we pay interest in those payments, but not always. Something like half, used to be half of the transactions. I actually don't quite remember the exact ratio anymore because we have so many different financial programs. But in many cases, the merchant chooses to tell you, you know what, no interest. Same as sticker price, you just pay over time through a firm, we'll pick up the interest effectively. In some cases, the merchant says, actually, if you want the service, you should pay for it. And typically, both the merchant and the consumer contribute. In some situations, the merchant just covers the entire thing. In some situations, consumer gets to pay some interest. In all cases, if there's interest involved, it's disclosed upfront as a dollar number in addition to the rate. So you know, on day zero, buying a $1,000 thing, going to pay $50 of interest, that number cannot increase. You can be late. You can choose to pay us in a slightly different schedule. That will be $50. If you choose to prepay, that number will go down. So it is designed with the financially responsible consumer in mind, where they benefit when we benefit. But how does Max Levchin make money? A firm more, perhaps, that right. makes money by sometimes charging merchants, sometimes charging consumer. Those, those are the only two um, primary business model, or that's, those are the revenue models. And then the business model is on the plus side or on the uh, income side, you have consumer interest payments and merchant, what's the industry jargon is merchant discount rate, which is just a fancy word for merchant fee. On the cost sides, in addition to all the fixed operating costs, you have cost of capital, most importantly. We're not a bank, which means that we borrow so that we can lend money. Cost of capital is a very relevant topic given the uh, inflation and the Federal Reserve's response to it. But in addition to that, we take the full risk. So if you decide or something happens and you can't pay us back, we will eat the loss. So the cost of losses. And then there's all sorts of assorted costs that come after that. Some are obvious, like cost of customer service, some of them are less obvious, like cost of data that we need to buy to underwrite consumers, and they all sort of slowly stack up to some number and subtract that number from the consumer fees and the merchant fees. And you have either a positive or negative unit economic business. We have been a positive unit economic business for a very long time. But if you subtract the fixed cost of operating the business, modulo some adjustments, you end up with a profitable or an unprofitable business writ large. This fiscal year, we just wrapped up we announced that we became an adjusted operating and composite business. So the business model happens to work. And I was going to ask you, what's in it for Amazon or your other partners? Why do they need you at the checkout? But I think you answered that when you said you assume responsibility for the payment. Is that what's in it for your partner? Primary value is detour a little bit, but it's a really important one. Before you go to the merchant value, the maybe more revealing thing is the consumer value. One-liner, I see and I read 
uncountable number of consumer reviews, both positive and negative, as much as I can to sort of make sure I understand what's really going on in my world. One great one-liner I read over and over again is, I use a firm so I can keep my credit card balances at zero. Because it is a better financial product and our consumers actually understand it, you don't revolve, you know exactly when you're gonna be done, you know precisely when that payment plan is over and you're done being in debt. We are frequently chosen by younger consumers who are financially savvy and say credit cards are kind of what got my parents in trouble back in 08 or thereabouts. I should look for a better way. The better way is let's not revolve, let's not pay late fees, let's not have deferred interest and all the other shenanigans from the financial services industry. Consumers pick us because they feel confident, they know exactly when the payment plan is gonna play out. Merchants are smart, they operate a business, they know there are consumers that'll come through and say, well, I don't really wanna borrow money to do this, I'm gonna wait, maybe I'll save, maybe I'll not buy today, what we do is make the decision easier and say, well, there's a different way to borrow money, one that's safer, one that gives you more confidence, where you know exactly when you're going to be out of debt. That group is quite sizable. That, that is the tens of millions of people that we've persuaded to give us a try. Last year, there was about 20, just a little bit over $20 billion worth of merchandise sold using a firm. So that the, the trend is on the rise. I should mention a firm is a publicly traded company. We'll get to that in a second. A couple more questions about the consumer end of things. So, and you can have, uh, your checking account automatically debited for the payments, I assume. What happens if you default and don't make a payment though? We'll send you several politely worded reminders to make sure that you haven't just forgotten. Vast majority of consumers that are late are not trying to run away with the money. And fortunately, vast, vast, vast majority are not in the category of bad things happening to good people where they lost their job or something awful happened and they can no longer make their payments. Those are fairly few and far between. Vast majority are just forgetful. They decided not to set up the automatic payment. They thought they could sort of keep up on their own. We're very good at reminding them and we've been able to figure out a way to do this without sort of slapping them with the uh, unpleasant reminder with a fee attached to it. So we don't charge late fees because we found that when bad things happen to good people, the last thing you wanna do is like, hey, you're late. Sounds like a terrible medical emergency, so sorry, but here's a lead fee to go with that. That's just not a great customer experience. People that say, haha, I never meant to pay you anyway, you can charge them a million dollars of lead fees, <laughs> that's probably not gonna come to you. And the vast majority of people are fine, they will absolutely pay you back. The reminder does the work without the haha. Now, the reason the industry, this, this is a hobby horse that I will get off in a second, but the industry loves their late fees. There's a sort of big push in the administration right now to get rid of junk fees, as they call it, which I think is a pretty apt name, not because it's a great reminder for people to pay. Like if you're what they call the sloppy payer, like, oh man, I forgot I should have linked my bank account, you have the money. The late fee is just an annoyance, but it's an annoyance you're gonna put up with because it's somewhere in terms of service. The business model is hidden in a fine print and that is a pure profit product. Yeah. And so we've consciously shooed that product that profit and said, we don't want to charge late fees because we want the positive customer experience. You mentioned higher interest rates or inflation. Higher interest rates means higher cost of money, higher costs for you. And I think your CFO talked about that a little bit recently as being obviously not great for your company. How are you guys managing that? Your transactions are up, but interest rates are up, right? Yep. So the good news is that when your middle name or maybe your first name is transparency, it's fairly easy in the sense that one, we're very upfront with our consumers and our merchants exactly what our costs look like and what, what is and isn't happening in the economy. We have gone to our merchant partners and told them, hey, our costs are increasing. We think that you should help us with that. And many of them were very understanding in part because we've been a good partner, in part because they still need to sell things. And so if our cost of operating is going up, just like their other vendors' cost of items that they're selling are going up, they have to adjust. And in some cases where consumer does pay interest, we've increased proportionately the cost to the consumer. The less obvious, but actually really important way of managing through the higher interest rate cycle, because we always give you what's called termed transactions. These are fixed term loans. Monthly, quarterly? Um, it's monthly. monthly or by, sometimes bi-weekly. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. the, the aver weighted average life of an affirmed loan including everything, everything is four and a half months. So it's quite short. Mm -hmm. We'll go as far as three-ish years and as short as six weeks. So mm -hmm. this is quite varied, but it's always fixed. And so we can manage through 
a higher cost of capital by shortening the average duration a little bit. And so by making a little bit fewer 18 months long loans and a little bit more six week long loans, it just allows us to recycle the money quicker and therefore lowers the effective cost. You've been doing this payment stuff for quite some time. I and mean, you were a member of the PayPal mafia going all the way back. What is that, 20 years ago now? It's a little more than that. More than that even, wow. Um, what is it that, 25? Not quite, between the two. Okay. 1998 is when I met and Peter Thiel. Elon, Peter Thiel, Reid Hoffman, that whole group of people was together. It's pretty amazing, right? So quite the place to be. What is it about payments and FinTech that excites you? Why, why does that kind of get you going? It's not the only thing that gets me going, but it's the thing that of the most important things in the world is the one I'm pretty good at. So I think the the right way of deciding, well, you're going to pour your personal energies for an entrepreneur anyway, and theoretically, you're not bound to any one idea or tether. So I say, well, I'm going to go change the world and do X. In my case, I was very lucky in my very early 20s. I ran into this guy, Peter Thiel. We started a company that became PayPal. The lesson was never going to do anything but start my own companies. But the meta lesson was I actually really love this payments world. It's infinitely complicated. There's always some idiosyncratic thing going on, both from the beginning of time as well as the latest change, be it regs, regulations, or something else. So it, it, it's forever stimulating. And yet, it's the largest market in the world. Money is the thing that makes the world go around. And everybody has both need for it, problems with it, issues understanding it, infinite number of possibilities if you see the number of problems in the world that has to do with money. I'm equally motivated by things like energy and food and water and health and education, all these sort of major things that humanity faces. I'm just not very good at any of them, but I'm decent at the money part. So with all of this evolution in this field and the new companies, we talk about you guys and Block and Stripe and PayPal, et cetera, et cetera, um, Venmo, um, the, credit, the legacy credit card companies, Visa, MasterCard, and American Express appear to be as strong as ever. Why is that? That is the power of a network business. Networks are these self-reinforcing systems where once they're there and lots of people are using them, the activation energy of just joining a network is infinitesimal relative to starting a new network. When we rolled out a firm, one of the kind of a standard rebuttals was, you really are going to go to all these merchants and persuade them to add one more logo. My very first uh, fundraising pitch, I, I kept the uh, the image around for posterity. I sort of had a designer mock up a convenience store door showing Visa, MasterCard, Amex, a firm logo. And it was the first Affirm logo, which has since changed, so I had to continuously update the image over the years. But the idea was, let's go be another network. Obviously, if you were the first merchant joining the Affirm network, your first question is going to be like, so how many users you got and who else is on this thing? Like, oh, I'm the first? Hmm. First one was 1-800-Flowers, one of our very, very long time ago partners. And uh, we've since expanded a little bit. So Amazon.com and Walmart.com and, and many, many others, of course. But it took a long time, companies over 10 years old, where we went around and convince people that the secular trend of younger consumers wanting to not revolve, wanting a better, more confidence-inspiring alternative to credit cards was a thing. And in the very early days, we would show up with, here's 15 merchants we have, here's what happened to their sales volume before and after a firm. Like, see this bump? That's us. That's us bringing in consumers that were sitting on the sidelines saying, ah, eh, not sure I have the money and I don't want to put it on my credit card. And this is what happens when you tell them, actually, there's an alternative now. At a certain point, it became a self-reinforcing thing where we too became a network of our own where consumers would say, oh, I've seen your guys' logo before. I've seen it on Walmart and now it's available on Amazon. Well, that's really cool. Of course, I'll use it again. Once you get to a certain scale, networks self-reinforce. Well, you guys are directly trying to disrupt the business of those, the, the big three, I would say. Or are you adjacent or complementary? I mean, the other, some of the others are very complementary and kind of additive to their business, but you are more of a disruptor, no? The other thing about payments that I love mm -hmm. is that it's all confusing that way. Mm -hmm. There's never a monopoly in payments. There's never pure competition in payments. There's never pure partnerships in payments. You always have to figure out, in this particular domain, are we friends or are we competitors? So 
we are a network. I wanted my logo next to Visa, MasterCard, and Amex in that convenience store door that I made up. And so theoretically, if you're not pulling out your Amex card, then you're using a firm. And that, that's a competitive relationship. Where a firm is not yet integrated, we just launched an Affirm card that is powered by us and Visa. And so the transactions where we cannot deliver the last mile to the consumer, it's our responsibility to make sure a firm works everywhere that is covered by Visa. And so in that sense, we are great partners and have done lots of business together for quite some time and expect to do more. At the limit of, well, I have a Visa card and a firm card, which one will I go with? In this case, Visa actually wins in both cases because both, both cards have a Visa logo. Except this one has economics that accrete to us and we think is a better product, and in the former case, maybe not. And so it's a little bit more complicated. Disruption is a word that was invented by the media to, I think, sell more stories. In payments, it doesn't quite work the same way. The scale of payments and financial services markets is significantly more than any existing player can possibly address. More sort of bluntly, we're all competing with cash. All right, I'm going to take issue with that point. I think disruption was invented by some Sand Hill Road person. Okay, I, I we'll just, have to I check. Just, I just can't. I, take I hear what you're saying. Of, I hear you saying. You're probably right. But it probably makes for good fundraising. Knows? We'll check. Um, one word that hasn't come up in this conversation, which is interesting, is crypto. How do you think about crypto? Well, I think recently everybody's been thinking less and less about crypto and more and more about AI. But I think of crypto the same way I've always thought about crypto. It's a brilliant technical innovation. The original 2008 Satoshi paper was sort of a light bulb that went off in a thousand heads or a million heads. And it's been a great solution looking for a problem ever since. There is plenty of money changing hands. And I'm being a little bit facetious. Obviously, Bitcoin is a well-established kind of a digital gold equivalent that its proselytizers wanted it to be. And it, at this point, it's a thing that people trade. They tried to get my email from my favorite investment bank telling me their summary of uh, events in the uh, in the crypto mining world. So it must be real. Doesn't sound like a focus of a firm, though. It's not because vast majority of normals, and that's our customer base, don't think twice about Bitcoin as a way they're going to buy their couch or their groceries. It, right. It's just not a medium of transaction, and we care very much about transactions. It sounds like you want me to ask you about AI, Max. What about AI, Max? Not necessarily, but I'm happy to, <laughs> to answer anything if you're okay. asking. Um, AI I'm very excited about. I think there's an incredible... I'm excited about AI, but I think I'm excited about things that are to come as opposed to what we have seen. I think the current state of AI is yet another moment in history where we kind of go, oh my God, this thing is so different and so real and so amazing. And it really is very impressive. But I think we're still scratching at the surface of what this new class of neural networks is capable of. And so we will see much more interesting breakthroughs in the next 10 years. My wife is a venture capitalist, and so she invests in this sort of thing. And the stuff that she's excited about doesn't yet exist. But that said, even today, we use AI at a firm for things like engineer productivity or developer productivity. So sort of a, a angel on your shoulder telling you that's a bad line of code, you shouldn't do that. Or while you're typing this, I'm going to create a set of unit tests for you to verify your code. All of that is much faster, much easier, much cheaper with AI. So those are profound, important things that are happening today. Uh, we use it for a bunch of really neat applications in anti-fraud, which is mm -hmm. always my, my, my favorite domain. Um, we are starting to look at applicability of large language models in things like customer service. You have to be very careful. There's lots of regulation. You can't tell someone, I'm an AI model. Here's my advice for you financially. So that, that will not happen. But there's lots of opportunities to do things like, let me help you navigate a frequently asked questions a little bit better with an LLM model. So lots of fun things happening for us in AI. The net new innovations in AI, my guess is, are three to five years out, and those will be profound. And most importantly, of course, is the sort of a, the quest for EGI, the self-improving system that just learns exponentially faster. And final question, Max, I said I was going to ask you about Affirm, the company, the stock. Why should investors own or buy a firm stock? What does the future of the company look like? The most important recent reveal. So I think it's very, very dangerous to say, here's one thing, you should own the stock because of this. This thing will be new today and old tomorrow. It may not be true if you're choosing this one reason to hang your hat on and then it's no longer accurate. Should you sell the stock? Those are all bad financial advices. 
the good financial advice, I think, sort of assess where we are today and where we can go. We just rolled out this card. We are in 65% of e-commerce volume. E-commerce is still 15% of total, by some measure, maybe 8%, depending on who you listen to, of total commerce out there. Card works both online and offline. So just blew the doors open from use a firm on your big screen, on your little screen, to use a firm when you go out grocery shopping, when you are going to buy a new TV, but also want to push some buttons before you commit to it. Already in the card usage, the most popular store people are spending money at is grocery stores of various kinds. And so people are embracing the idea of, we call them honest financial transactions, honest financial services, but a firm as a way to pay for things that's better than credit cards for everyday purchases. Today's usage of average, so some people are very committed to a firm and some people are casual, you know, first time users. The average on an annual basis is four transactions. Now it's doubled over the last couple of years, but it's still tiny relative mm -hmm. to what we think it should be. Part of it is couldn't use it offline. Now you can. Like we are, the the, uh, the chart for new cards that we send out to consumers just over the last quarter, we published it in our latest earnings report. Looks like a vertical line. Mm. So these are these are, you know, looks a little bit like a white combinator pitch day demo, and uh, it's for a reason. It's a product market fit. People love it. They're grabbing these cards and they're using them to buy groceries. And so. I'm, you know, I'm I'm, I'm a, uh, a firm shareholder by way of having never sold a single share that, that I got as, as a founder, in a big way because I think we just expanded our total addressable market to the tune of four to five x. Mm -hmm. We'll continue trying to find new ways to do that again. Max Levchin, CEO of a firm. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. This is at Barron's. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll catch you next time.